I'm concluding my master's at the University of Sao Paulo, and this that is a collaboration between the Universities of Sao Paulo and uh, University of Portsmouth, and this was financed by FAPESP, that's a Brazilian agency, and it will be pretty much a tectonic, metamorphic tectonic evolution of another neoproterozoic sedimentary unit in Brazil, so pretty much similar to what people have been presenting here today, and a couple of challenges that we had. So in the geologic time scale, we are located in the Gondwan amalgamation. That was during the Neoproterozoic, and these collisions were around 750 and to 500 million years during the, what we call the Brazilian Panathrone orogeny. So there was a long-lived quaternary orogeny uh, with the amalgamation of cratons and also some microcontinents. And this caused the formation of different belts. And we are studying more specifically this belt here that's called the Rubeda belt that was formed due to this amalgamation of uh, Kong, the, the Cratons Congo, San Francisco, Paranapanema, and there's a small Craton here called Luis Alves. So the aim of our study is to understand the tectonic metamorphic evolution of one important metasedimentary unit that hasn't been st uh, deeply studied yet, and to assess uh, the validity of using monocyte petrochronology because this uh, technique has been used broadly, well, all over the world, but especially on younger terrains. So in older terrains, we have a couple of more challenges due to the temporal precision of the method. So this is the Rubeda belt. This is a long scale, this is where we are in Brazil, large scale belt, uh, belt and it's like 1,400 kilometers long. And this was, the, this was formed during this collision of those cratons here with some microcontinents and they all have different tectonic histories and they are bounded by those large scale shear zones. And in the area we are studying here in the southmost part of the, the belt, the collisions that formed this area occurred around 620 to 570 million years. So this is a metal sedimentary unit we are studying. Uh, it's called the Turbo Cajeti Formation, or just called TCF to make it easier. So this is composed of some rocks on, from different metamorphic grades. So this one here is some uh, phyllites from the granite zone. We also have this one here that is from the medium TCF, what we call that it's our, they are on the starolite or on the silimonite zone. And we also have we also have this one here on the granulate facies, and they also have evidence evidence of partial melting. They are on the kyanite K field spar zone or on the silimonite K field spar zone. And then on this cross section, we can see that we have an inverted metamorphic sequence where the medium rocks overlay the lower metamorphic rocks. And also here where we have this, uh, the basement that is arched into paleoproterozoic trusted over the neoproterozoic rocks. So we have a couple of ages to this area, especially on this part of the, the unit. And they point to the maximum depositional age of around 650 to 630 million years, followed by some the metamorphic events started around 600 to 570 million years. And then we have this intrusion of this A-type here, granite, around 580 million years, and also the installation of those transcurrent shear zones around 580 to 530 million years. So those shear zones were active from a, a long time, a long period. So they caught a lot of displacement on the area. And while well, the methodology that was used, again, it's pretty similar to what some people have done. Uh, PT conditions and path were made with uh, thermodynamic modeling with perplex. And we also use monocyte petrochronology, combining uranium lead uh, data with trace elements composition on the uh, LAICPMS. So our sample selection was made. So yeah, outcrops in Brazil are pretty affected by weathering. So we only have a couple of good outcrops. So we have those samples, we keep them. And we try to pick from also for some different metamorphic grades. So from starlight zone, silimonite zone, kyanite k field spar zone, and silimonite k field spar zone. And we also try to get some uh, samples from different structural positions. So north from some shear zones or south for some shear zones. So we could understand this relation as well. I'll quickly show some samples and then some of the techniques that we did. And then I'll try to combine because I don't have enough time to show all the data. So this sample here is from the silimonite zone. It's a common schist with full of silimonite and biotite. Uh, this is the only granite grain that we have in the sample, and it has a strong zoning. So zoning on the major elements and zoning on the trace elements as well, and they're different as expected. So we, we defined a couple of different uh, granite graph zones. So zone one, zone two, zone three, and zone four. 
And we try to constrain the PT conditions by modeling each one of those, uh, the PT conditions should each one of those stages graph. So we model a local composition and then we try to remove each one of those stages of granite graph from this composition and model a new sort of session. So the first one here, we use the whole bulk composition uh, to present the, this formation of this one here, Z1. So we model it and we got those conditions. We remove this part from the bulk composition, model a new sort of session that I'm not presenting here to constrain the conditions to graph of this Z2. And then we remove this part again and model a new sort of session. They were all constrained with garnet uh, isoplates and also with some other minerals. And we got those this Z3 conditions here that would probably be the metamorphic peak around 6.8 kilobars and 680 uh, Celsius degrees on the sillimanite zone. The example here is from the sterilite zone. Uh, so we have this, this is how it looks like. We have this huge sterilites full of inclusions. It seems to have a later graph of sterilite here that uh, it doesn't have any inclusions. And I also have uh, possibly two uh, graphs of uh, biotite. And this is what the garnet looks like. So they are pretty much rounded. They also have this different zoning. And uh, what is interesting here that we have this in depleted in yttrium core, followed by a rich uh, yttrium rich ring, and then depleted again on the rims. And the manganese position is also curious because we have lower values on the core and higher values on the rims. So to constrain the PT conditions, we did pretty much the same approach. So we removed each one of those stages and constrained three different uh, sort of sessions constrained with isoplates. So we got this range of, uh, of temperature around 520 to 600 Celsius degrees under this pressure around uh, eight kilobars. We did monazite petrochronology to this rock. And what we can see is that we have some different populations either included preserved in different positions, geographic dispositions. So we have a couple of them included in garnet. There are those, those one red here. And we also have a couple of them included in sterilite, or those ones in green. And we also see some different populations uh, based on their yttrion and their higher earth elements distribution. So we have those ones in light blue enriched in yttrion, and this ones in, in yellow that are depicted in yttrion. So we can see on, on, the, on the plots that we have a range of metamorphic events at least around 620 to 570 million years. And we also have this older, slightly older monocytes, uh, but they have pretty much similar composition to the others. So they could be present on the rock before, or they could be from the prograde path. Uh, that's not 100% sure. Uh, but as they have different chemistries, we can address that they were formed on different reactions, possibly during multiple events of monocyte formation. But unfortunately, as the precision of the method uh, to all the rocks is not very, well, it's 2%. So uh, our ages overlap within the uncertainty. So we can address the order of those reactions, but we are making some interpretations here, uh, some hypotheses that, so those purple ones would be already there on the, on the, on the sample, either prograde or from previous. Uh, then we would have these yellow ones growing, growing, um, they would be depleted in each one, so they would be growing during garnet graph. And some of them would be entrapped in sterilite that was growing slightly later. And then we would have, after that, the graph of those uh, blue, light blue ones, uh, possibly during a, a time of garnet, not garnet growing or from some garnet consumption. We're not 100% sure. We also have this, uh, this yttrium ring here that is possibly related to xenotene. We have some inclusions here of xenotene. So this could be a source of this yttrium enrichment. We also have this sample here from the highest metamorphic rate. So there's a paraginase uh, composed of quartz, K-feldspar, uh, biotite and garnet and silimonite. And what we can see here is that this garnet, it's being consumed and it replaced by quartz and feldspar and biotite. And we don't have, the, the their trace elements distribution is not very well. It seems to be very homogeneous, even though we do have some lower values of high earth elements here in some points on the core. And the PT conditions extend to this rock, it's around 800 Celsius degrees and uh, pressure between 12 to 10 kilobars. So it, the sample also has kyanite included in K-feldspar. 
So we interpret that the smelting occurred also in the kyanite uh, field, even though it's pretty much the aluminum silicate, aluminum silicate right now, it's silimanite. So this sample has bigger monazites. We did some uh, LAICPMS maps in, with those, in some of those grains. So we have a different European anomaly, a different, the European distribution is slightly different than the other trace elements here. And those points are located in the cores and they also match the lowest tor uranium ratios. And those are also some of the oldest ages. So this blue one here also has a strong European anomaly. And we also have those two points here with a less pronounced European anomaly. Those two, that's all those black here, they could be related to the prograde path where um, uh, melting hasn't started yet. So they are located here on this high European zone. And uh, on this sample, that one, that, that one high, high European, uh, sorry, older, but uh, with low European, it also appears on this monazite. So we have this uh, group of ages much older than the rest of our group. But they all present uh, pretty much the same uh, the same European anomaly. So we interpret that those ages, they, uh, those monazite grains, they were already on the rock, but they had some igneous where uh, it was growing during feldspar crystallization as well. We also see there is a slightly different distribution to the trace elements, European, even though the European again it's pretty much the same range. So as this European is, has a similar range, we interpret that this monazite grew during melting, during the melting period. And this relation with trace elements, uh, different relation with trace elements could be related to garnet. And we can see a thin ring uh, enriched in high rough elements, again, in the end, that could be related to this garnet consumption here. But there are some recent studies that are questioning uh, this strong relation between garnet and monazite in trace elements. So we are still debating this. So our, some of our prelim, preliminary conclusions, again, this is, we are concluding the works, so we're still discussing some, some things. So we can see that the max, metamorphism events uh, that were previously identified are starting around 600 million years. We are spending these at least until 630 or 640 million years. And we also can see, so we have this quick deposition followed by, follow quickly by the metamorphic events. And we also see the two samples are the ones that I showed here in detail. They record older ages around 620 and 650 million years, while others that unfortunately couldn't show, they record only younger ages. But at the same time, we can see that the metamorphic events seem to have stopped in all the samples around 580 to 570 million years. So this could uh, change slightly how we see the, the tectonic evolution of the area. And we wanted to address the petrochronology is very important to our study, even though we can address exactly when those reactions occurred. We can see that they are different reactions, different monazite generation. And with ultra element distribution, we would never be able to see this. And finally, this is just uh, some of the, the big paths that we are trying to address. So we can see that they all have, they, they seem to have different uh, paths, so this could be related to different tectonic settings. So we are, we are, that's the point of discussion we are right now, trying to understand the, the, the effects of that on our tectonic evolution. So those shear zones may have displaced a lot of things, so they could have different tectonic histories. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Bruno. Um, just to try and stay on time, I think we'll have to move on to the next talk, but hopefully if people have questions, um, they'll ask them in the chat. Um, potentially, you could just quickly answer the one that's been posted while the next person yes, I'm shares trying their to screen. See, I'm um, trying to see the chat, sorry. So, sorry, so, Sylvia is asking, um, she's not sure if she missed it, but how are the older monazite ages in the Silimonite K Feldspar rock interpreted? On the Silimonite K Feldspar, yes. Yeah, so part of them, we are trying to interpret, I don't know if you're seeing anything, we are trying to interpret as uh, probably the, that would be the trifle, but for an igneous source, and some of them could be from the progress path because they also they all have this stronger open anomaly. So that's why we think that it, it has an igneous source, even though they're older. Okay, thanks very much.